all right. Hello, everyone. Um, before coming to Penn, actually, I worked for a few years in the wearables industry and, and worked with heart rate and different measures. And I was always curious on how these measures uh, relate to uh, behavioral states and seizure patients. So I focused my thesis around that. So the goal of my thesis was, how can we use heart rate variability parameters to understand brain states in patients with seizure? And then how can you use wearable devices like Apple Watch and Fitbit to detect uh, and predict seizures? Uh, epilepsy is a huge problem. Over 65 million people have epilepsy and about a third of them are uncontrolled through medication. Uh, we'll focus on what leads up to, an ep uh, up to a seizure. Uh, there are several triggers. Most of these are self-reported. There's no quantitative measure to, uh, to quantify or to measure these things yet. But as you can see, uh, a lot of these things can be measured these days using wearable devices. Uh, there has been a lot of research going on in this area. Uh, there are several devices that focus on uh, commercial aspect of it and the research aspect of it. Uh, but the big problem with wearable devices and devices in general is uh, people are already stressed. So are, there's a huge compliance problem. So we focus the research on commercially available uh, mass market devices like Apple Watch and Fitbit, which people uh, tend to wear more often. So in part one of the analysis, we'll focus on heart rate variability in brain states. Uh, this is a retrospective study of data already available in the lab. Uh, so this is, uh, so seizure, people who have seizure uh, often come to the hospital either for medication or for people who are non-responsive to medication, they go through uh, surgical procedures and different um, things like uh, vagus nerve stimulation. So they come and stay in the epilepsy monitoring unit for, for a few days. And this recording is from uh, that, uh, that stay of uh, subjects. So what we do is you use functional connectivity in, um, networks. So basically what we want to do is we want to understand brain states. So we want to understand the dynamics of the brain before a seizure. And network theory has been shown to be a good way of capture, uh, capturing this dynamics, capturing the complex behavior of uh, seizures and of the brain in general. So we use network theory for that. So the way we've built a network is uh, the EEG data that's shown here, the electrodes form the nodes and the correlation between no electrodes forms the edges between the nodes. And so we get a network. So what we do is we uh, take an hour of data before the seizure and we build networks in one minute windows. And then we calculate a few network parameters. In parallel, we also use ECG data. So this is a retrospective study, so we still don't have wearable devices, but the heart rate from the ECG is comparable to what the wearable devices can give. And so we calculate a few heart rate variability parameters, and then we try to get the correlation between them, try to see how they co-vary. Sorry. My bad. Okay. The slides got messed up. So when we see this, what we see is heart rate is the strongest correlation to network parameters, both of them, global efficiency and node strength. And when we do a subgroup analysis, we basically cluster the nodes into few subgroups based on how, how flexible the network is, how much the network is stable over time. And we see that the nodes that are in the network that's with low flexibility or highly stable, they have the highest correlation of uh, uh, network parameters with heart rate. So heart rate is very strongly correlated with the network changes in these nodes. So through this method, what we're able to show is a quantitative measure to find a relationship between heart rate variability and brain states. Uh, this could have applications like uh, forecasting, identifying triggers. But as you see, this was a small study with a few patients. Uh, we are planning a bigger study with more number of patients, also a long duration study. But what, this, what we did next for this gives that gives an indication that there is something between heart rate variability and brain states. So we need to dig a little deeper. And how the next question is, how can we use wearable devices to add value to this whole study? So we did a prospective study. We actually designed a study with the Penn Medicine Hospital. And uh, in this study, apart from just having uh, the ECG and EEG, we also had uh, wearable devices. 
uh, and we had surveys with them. So, so far we've recruited seven subjects and I helped run the study and collect data for the study, which I spent bulk of my time in the thesis doing. And you've recruited seven subjects so far. So the first thing we did was we took the ECG data and we had to, uh, we had to get long-term heart rate uh, values. And uh, compared to the previous study, we had to do some novel uh, denoising and filtering techniques here because there's a lot of leak from the ECG device. So I helped design a new technique which would denoise the signal through all the states and which would give us better heart rate uh, peak detection. So now when we compare how the heart rate changes with uh, compares to wearables and ECG, we see that generally uh, the wearable devices provide different heart rate based on the type of device. Uh, you see in general Fitbit is better uh, with the average heart rate sampling of 0.5 Hertz and Apple Watch is much lower. Also in Apple Watch, you see that when we keep the activity workout or activity tracking on, it's better than when it's off. There's a trade-off with battery life uh, and uh, data quality here. When we do some more statistical analysis, we find that although Apple Watch has lesser sampling, it actually has better data quality. It agrees more with ECG heart rate, at least. Uh, it, the last patients we've improved our protocol, uh, our system much to a good extent now, so we get a very good ag agreement between the two. Uh, what we also see is a band Altman analysis. Basically, this is the agreement between uh, the two variables, between heart rate measured from the ECG and the wearable. And what we want to see is the, the two bands, the two lines on top and bottom, show the 95% confidence level. So we want the bands to be narrower, shows a higher confidence between two measurements. So what we see here is Apple Watch generally has better agreement with ECG as compared to... Uh, the Fitbit watch. So next we calculate uh, heart rate variability parameters using the wearable device. And we find the correlation to be quite low between ECG and that. And the biggest reason, if you guys uh, guess by now is because of the low sampling, because the heart rate is so low sampled as compared to ECG, we don't capture as much of the variability of the heart rate in general. So next, uh, because we weren't able to do that really well, what we did was we went ahead and used the heart rate from the ECG and tried to find out what more can we do. And then in parallel, we also planned on how we can improve the, uh, the calculations or the recording from the variables so that we can bring it up to the same level. And then once we get the analytics ready, we would have data from the variables to do the same analysis. So we did this something called the behavioral state analysis using variables. So, uh, there are two uh, columns here. Uh, on the left is uh, the, the, uh, the dotted line marks a seizure of a particular subject. And the, the data is eight hours before and eight hours after the seizure. Uh, on the right is the same time frame on a non-seizure day. This is to get a baseline of what the subject is, uh, what the subject is going through on a non-seizure day. And since a lot of the heart rate video parameters have circadian rhythm through the day, it goes high and low through the day. We took the same time period to have a fair comparison. So uh, I'd like to point the focus on the second row, which is basically the RMSSD values. And what we can see is right before the seizure, the value goes to a really high level and then drops to a low level around or after the seizure. And this is an indicator of what's happening in the subject. This, such patterns are also seen in, in, uh, in research with athletes where the heart rate variability goes high when they are doing well and it goes low after a stressful event around a stressful event. So though it's not uh, indicate, statistically indicative yet, but this was a good uh, uh, indication of what could be possible through variable devices and heart rate variability in general. Uh, this is uh, repeated over a su few subjects. We can see this pattern over a few subjects. This is a cluster of seizures uh, spaced around five to six hours apart. And we see similar patterns of it going to a high state and coming down to a low state after a seizure. There's a lot of uh, interpatient variability. We don't see the same patterns all the time. Um, so in this subject, it doesn't go too high before the seizure. It doesn't drop too low after the seizure. But in general, uh, we see some patterns of variations more around the seizure than non-seizure. So since we are a small cohort, uh, our biggest thing is to actually increase the cohort size. We also see in this subject a huge variation in heart rate. So uh, in some subject, there's more variation in the second degree some of there's a motivation first degree. So this still requires more analysis. 
So the biggest thing you're able to show from all this was that uh, heart rate variable parameters correlates with brain states quite well. Uh, then we showed that, that it has potential to uh, identify behavioral states like what we just showed and seizure triggers. But what we need to do is uh, uh, combine more data streams and, and also more number of subjects. And what this can all show is that there's a possibility that it could detect and predict seizures uh, down the line. The caveat, of course, is we definitely need more subjects and more patients. Also, huge inter uh, inter subject variability, and epilepsy is quite heterogeneous, so it, it makes it quite hard to uh, generalize unless you have a huge uh, number of people. Also, the the variable devices have a lot of technical issues, including low sampling, uh, charging, discharging, you have to charge multiple times a day. Uh, it is logistically quite intensive. So you're trying to fix those problems uh, to make sure you can still use variables. The silver lining is the variable heart rate was quite well correlated to ECG. So we do have hope that it can be used for uh, accurate measurement. So what are the next steps? Uh, the network work that we did, uh, uh, it's quite novel in the sense that previous work has been done on fMRI, but our work was on, on long-term EEG data. And this, uh, we submitted this paper to ICTLS. It's a quantitative uh, conference for epilepsy. And it has been accepted there. It's in July. Uh, what else you want to do is, for that, we're going to use a larger cohort, and we're going to do a focus study of network parameters in certain regions of the brain. How do those correlate with heart rate? How can we remove, get uh, actionable results from that for uh, patient life cycle? We also have plans of improving uh, variables data sampling. So we, we know that the watch itself has really accurate data on itself, on the watch. So we can use APIs, build apps on the watch to do local recording so that we don't have to uh, uh, use sparse data that it loads on the cloud. Uh, the next big thing is also integrating part one and part two. So we know variables can do something innovative with behavioral states, and we know networks can do something innovative with brain states. So now how do we integrate both of them? And the last important part is feedback from the subject. We did have surveys uh, questions that the subject answers. So we want to have a more involved uh, two-way communication process where we get better feedback from the subject of what's happening. Uh, so I would like to thank all my lab members and my uh, PIs for supporting me and helping me through this journey. It was a really rewarding experience to explore seizures and uh, brain states in general. Uh, finally, I'd like to leave with this particular graph of what my journey has been. I do heart rate variable analysis on myself too. I've been wearing a watch and you can see that it does. It, the biggest thing and takeaway is spring break is a really important part of life. And then there's downhill after that. So, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just lay out some gaps for questions. Um, I'm going to ask the audience for questions. I'm going to ask you to repeat those questions so people are going to hear them and then answer. Okay. Okay. So questions from the audience. If you guys are not asking, I'm going to be asking. So. <laughs> okay. I have a lot of questions. First question is, do you know how the wearable, so Fitbit or Apple, is actually filtering the raw data for the heart rate? So we have some... Uh, the question first. All right, sorry, thank you. So the question was, do we know if uh, the wearable, do we know how the wearable devices like how, Apple Watch and Fitbit filter the data before giving it to us? Because we just use the data as they gave it. Uh, so there is some information on the internet of how they filter it, but it's not clear because they have proprietary software. So the... One of the big things you can see this variability is actually because the, the devices uh, dynamically switch uh, sampling because when you're active, they want to sample it higher and when you're not active, they want to sample it lower quite clearly. So we know they do some amount of dynamic sampling. We don't know exactly what the algorithm is, uh, but that's the best we have right now. Uh, Think that it's 
Hi. So the question was, uh, we see a difference between sampling of ECG and variable. So can we interpolate the variable devices to the same sampling of ECG and then calculate? Uh, theoretically, we can, of course, interpolate, but we do, we don't, we, when it's low subsample, we lose the variability that we're really looking for. So, uh, so it really is application dependent. If you want to calculate variability over a day, we can still do it. Because, uh, for example, the data I showed from my thing is actually day averages, and they do a pretty good uh, job of giving us information. If you want to do a shorter time scale average, we do lose some information uh, over over uh, by interpolating from from that data. Especially for variability analysis, if you want to just purely use heart rate changes over long duration, it would work just fine. Uh, we have another question. Uh, for, for the uh, Oh, so there are different subjects. So there you uh, uh, use six subjects. So we have recruited seven subjects. One subject's data is still being processed. So we've used six subjects that were remaining. Uh, uh, yeah, it was the latest one, the Apple Watch Series 7. Uh, we didn't change the OS. We didn't change anything to work, which is the same one. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jujia Chong, and I'm presenting my work supervised under Dr. Rahul Manharam and Dr. Hannah Loeb. And the topic of my research is uh, dry rights, shipping public's trust, preference understanding towards autonomous vehicles using a virtual reality simulation platform. Yeah, this work is part of the greater efforts of the dry right project held between the University of Pennsylvania and the uh, Canadian Mellon University. It received support from the Mobility 21 National University Transportation Center, CMU, which is supported by the U.S. Department of Transportation. So in this project, the main research problem we would like to address is how can we promote safe and efficient autonomous vehicle adoption? And our proposed method is a uh, virtual reality driving simulator. And in doing that, we would like to answer two questions. The first is, does a driving simulator changes people's attitude to be more positive towards autonomous vehicles? And the second is, can a driving simulator be a good tool for autonomous vehicle demonstration and education? Yeah, first of all, let's get some background information. Every year, more than 30,000 people die in the US because of traffic accidents, as indicated by that, uh, yeah, one of the blue lines. Although the number has been decreasing due to increased government regulations, the uh, better in vehicle technology and people's increased awareness on safety, the number remains high and unacceptable. So in this case, what can autonomous vehicles do for us? According to the US Department of Transportation, autonomous vehicles have a high promise on safety, which means they can reduce uh, human-related errors and human-related accidents. And they also provide the increased mobility options and could provide transportation for the elderly population, people with disabilities and people from underrepresented communities. Uh, they allow travel to be faster and save their time on the road and they consume less energy and, is, and are environmentally friendly. So overall, they provide huge benefit both uh, socially, economically and environmentally. However, something that is not so clear to the public is the uh, definition of the five levels of automation. According to SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, there are five different levels of vehicle automation. Everything below and including level two, as indicated by the blue color here, is regarded as driver's assistance. And everything from above is considered as automation. At level two, features include uh, adaptive cruise control, automatic lane centering, and automatic emergency brake. However, the driver must remain control of the vehicle at all times. Uh, starting at level three, the vehicle can drive itself. However, the driver must be ready to take over at any time. At level four, the self-driving conditions are expanded and the driver can drive it, and the vehicle can drive itself most of the times. However, the human intervention may still be needed from time to time. 
at level five, no human intervention is ever needed and the vehicle is fully automated. The vehicle may not be equipped with the steering wheel or the pedals uh, at this point. So the important question is how can we interact with the automation system at each level? There's no doubt that with each increased level of automation, the driver's uh, physical workload and mental pressure will be tremendously decreased. However, it is imp extremely important that we understand what are the capabilities and limitations of an autonomous system at each level. If a driver does not trust the autonomous system at all and do not use it at all, and then they will not be able to enjoy this benefit. However, if a driver just trusts the uh, autonomous system without doubt, for example, let's say uh, level three or level four, that can be very risky driving and can lead to uh, serious traffic accidents. So in this case, why are the simulators necessary? Our drive right work matters because we think driving simulators provide a platform for the uh, drivers to get an understanding of an, autonomous, of an autonomous vehicle in advance and build an ex expectation of its behavior so that when they get into an actual vehicle, they have been prepared. And they have been prepared in a way that will allow them to interact with the technology to maximize the benefit and minimize the risk. Yeah, our proposed simulator in this study is based on CARA, an open source autonomous driving simulator first introduced by Intel. CARA has a rich, digital, has a rich collection of digital assets, contains long-term support, and, and supports a complete sensor suite that should be uh, equipped on an autonomous vehicle. And this is a image showing a typical example of what the car simulation world looks like. You can add your vehicles, pedestrians, and control the environmental parameters. Basically, you can set up the simulation in uh, whatever way you like. However, one problem with Carla is that because it was mainly designed for the uh, autonomous driving algorithm validation research, it displays all the vehicles as in third person view, as you can see on the uh, top images. So all these vehicles have a low level of detail, which means you cannot see through, see through them and you cannot sit inside like a real one. And to fix that problem, we imported an Audi vehicle model from the Unreal Engine car configurator project. With uh, this Audi model has a high level of detail and the images on the bottom shows its uh, exterior and interior. The headset we use for virtual reality simulation is an Oculus Quest 2, which is introduced by the company Meta. Uh, although our generic implementation using the OpenXR allow our implementation of Carla VR to be displayed on any virtual reality headset, and the transfer process is easy. And during the simulation, the users will not be using the headset controllers. And instead, they will be using this Logitech G29 steering wheel and pedal set to control the vehicle. There are two modes, the manual driving mode and the uh, autonomous mode. In the manual mode, you can just turn the wheel and press the pedals to control the vehicle like a conventional one. And in the autonomous mode, the steering wheel will turn by itself like a real autonomous vehicle. And in all cases, the position of the, uh, simul of the wheel in the simulation will match the position of this G29 wheel. And this is a picture of the uh, complete simulation setup. As you can see, you sit in the simulation chair wearing the Oculus Quest headset and hold tight to your steering wheel. And we have two monitors. The monitor on the left shows your view in the Carla simulation world. This is also what you are seeing inside your headset. And the monitor on the right shows the third person car vehicle tracking view. This is only available to, uh, to the developers to help us get a state of where the vehicle is going. And I'm going to show a video just displaying how the thing looks like. Oh, I'm sorry. Before that, we have designed three scenarios, the rural, the city, and the highway. The rural scenario is a representation of the suburban environment consisting most of uh, trees, shrubs, wildland country roads, and stop signs. 
It serves as a familiarization process for the participant to get used to the simulation setup, the controls, and the autonomous driving mode. The city scenario is uh, populated with buildings, vehicles, pedestrians, and traffic lights. So the main purpose of designing this scenario is to show the capabilities of, of autonomous vehicles in a complex city environment. And we have the highway scenario. In the highway scenario, there are three different behaviors in the autonomous driving mode, the cautious, normal, and aggressive. Different driving behavior has different the upper speed limit, different acceleration brake, and different lane preference. Behaviors can also be adjusted using the buttons on our uh, Logitech G29 steering wheel. Yeah, and now it's the uh, video. I'm going to talk through it as I play. This, uh, this part shows the uh, vehicle interior. You can see the steering wheel and we have the autopilot off sign on the center control panel. That is the uh, passenger seat and also the rear passenger seat. You can see the seat belt. And one thing you might also be interested in is that you can see all the views through the vehicle windshield. And I'm turning the steering wheel in the real world which is match the simulation. And this is the rural scenario right now. I'm at the stop sign and I'm driving the vehicle manually. The autopilot mode is off as shown again, shown on the control panel. I'm just making a turn and you can see the wheel turning. Uh, this next one is a city scenario. It has a lot of different vehicles, pedestrians, and traffic lights. And you may be able to see the right waypoint that is leading the vehicle. Right now, we are in the autonomous mode. You can see the autopilot sign on and it says normal. So these right waypoints are, are indicators of where the vehicle is going in the next few seconds. This helps us get a pretty good prediction of its behavior. And that is a highway scenario. Again, we have the uh, leading waypoints we are in the aggressive autonomous driving mode. And I change it to normal and you can see a speed decrease. And right now it's detecting a vehicle in the front. So it just slows down. Okay, yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, that's what the video looks like and a short demonstration. We also did a small human study with 36 participants. On the left is our human study recruitment flyer. And on the right are some quantitative questions we gave out during our human study. And here the PR stands for perceived risk, Q stands for perceived usefulness, P stands for perceived ease of use, TR is for trust, and BI is for behavioral intention. For each category, there are three sub-questions, and all these questions were measured in the five-point Likert scale. Uh, these questions were given to, the, to our participants before they tried the simulator and after, the tri after they tried the simulator. In this way, we would like to see if there's any uh, statistical difference in their attitude. Yeah, this plot is, uh, shows part of our result from the human study. It's just a simple analysis of the mean and standard deviation. The blue bars are the result before the simulator, and the orange bars are the result after the simulator. As we can see here, after the simulator experiment, we can see a increase of scores in the perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use, trust, and behavioral intention. And we see a decrease in the score of the perceived risk. And we verify this result with a ranked Wilkerson test and shows that all these changes are statist statistically significant. Yeah, we also discussed with our uh, participants of the potential applications of, the, of this driving simulator or driving simulators in general. And two of the most probable places are at auto dealerships and the driving schools. 
So at an auto dealership, a driving simulator can complement a real vehicle test drive. Other driving simulators cannot provide the, you know, the physical motion or the sense of alertness as you're on the road. They offer their unique advantages. For example, they are perfectly safe, perfectly controllable, and you can try it as soon as you want. They do not require a driver's license or insurance information or safety expert with you on the road. So yeah, and you can have anyone to try it. And at driving schools, a driving simulator can also be a good training tool for drivers and also those who do not know how to drive. For drivers, they can just try the simulator for a while and learn to interact with all those say, autonomous features that's available on the vehicle. And for people to, who do not know how to drive, they can still interact with the autonomous features. Moreover, they can use the steering wheel and pedals to try to learn to drive. So the driving simulator is a good tool for people from different groups. Uh, I want to share an example. There's this uh, Tesla Owners Club of Pennsylvania. And what they do is there is they train new Tesla drivers on how to operate their vehicle. Every week they give lecture talks. Every week they give lecture talks and provide one-on-one -on -one tutorial sessions, which is very time consuming. So they are very interested in a driving simulator as they could significantly save time and effort of the mentors and also provide more intuitive and interactive training sessions. Yeah, we also had some related publications on this topic. We had a paper accepted by the SAE Journal of Connected Automated Vehicles. Yeah, that's on a different simulator and a different focus, but it's still under the general, the same topic. And we also just submitted a paper to the transportation re research part F on this topic, on this CARA simulator. And we have the uh, full CARA via installation instruction available at this website and it's on the open license. Anyone who's interested, you can just go and check it out. Yeah, and finally, I would like to thank my thesis advisor, Dr. Rahul Manharam and Dr. Helen Lowe for providing long-term guidance and support on this project. I would also like to thank my fellow student, Shadow Sun, for contributing to the virtuality part of the project. And also, finally, I would like to thank all participants for coming. They have shared great thoughts and ideas that not only help me accomplish this work, but also enlighten my future work. And that's the end of my presentation. I'll open to questions. Okay, same thing as before. I'm going to ask the audience mm -hmm. some questions. Please repeat them and, okay. then, uh, and then proceed to answer. Okay. Questions. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so the question is, in my video demo, a lot of like driving conditions are just normal. Is there any way to simulate a dangerous driving scenario? And the answer to that is actually yes. And we actually have that in the city scenario, but just due to the time constraint, we're not showing it here. But in a driving simulator, you can simulate any type of scenario as you want. So a big part of driving and dynamic uh, action like that is, is uh, the reaction time. And so how do we account for reaction time between the uh, simulator, the VR uh, headset, and all of that? So how do you account for delays in your Okay, so you asked about like a big part of the problem with simulators are the reaction time and how do we work on to reducing the delays and uh, in the VR and in the steering wheel. So I so we think like the reaction time in the VR is actually quite responsive. And for the steering wheel, we have taken some systematic tests and we have shown that the response from the steering wheel input to your response in the simulator is less than a hundred milliseconds, actually microsecond. So that part is quite negligible. So overall, we think the simulator is very responsive and could be an effective tool. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. So next step, dimensional. Okay. Yeah, the next step. So right now our simulator is VR and you sit in a simulator chair. So next step, we are trying to convert it to MR. 
So we will, we will be actually sitting in a real car and uh, we have screen screens around the car. So like everything through the windshield is a green screen, which will be, re be replaced by the uh, simulation world. In that way, you sit in a real car, observe everything inside it, using made controls using the real steering wheel and pedals, but you just the simulation world will be different. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Hi everyone, my name is Harvey and my thesis is called line labeling and contour detection using Solo V2. And my advisor is Professor Jan Bushi. Uh, so typically in computer vision, we can do a lot of different applications like hand robotic interaction, segmentation, uh, pose estimation. But a lot of times these models are very limited by the amount of training data that we have, both in the quantity and quality of the data. So for example, if we take robotic hand object interaction, understanding of some of the finer details of the object could be very beneficial to reduce the like training amount of training data we need. Specifically for like a robotic setting, we're very much interested in the contact points between the hand and the object. So the convexity of the edges or contours on the object, as well as the junctions, like you wouldn't want to pick up an object from one of the corners. So a data set that could give us that type of leverage to learn more about different types of objects would be very beneficial. But the problem is a data set that labels the contours and junctions currently doesn't exist in literature. So the first main contribution of my thesis is to create a data set like this. So I look at 2D scenes and I label the contour definition as concave, convex, or obscuring, which I'll describe more in the next slide. And the main point I wanna make is that this data set has no human manual labeling. It's all completely automated. So if I were to take more data set types like this and automate the process, it would be very quick for labeling and it wouldn't require human power. Uh, additionally, I'll show that I can do a segmentation application on it. And I use the architecture solo and add an additional branch to show that we can increase performance and segmentation. Okay, so the first basic concept is the line labeling scheme that I use. So each of these edges, but basically I call them contours, have a different type of convexity. So edges that look something like this, as you can see, like in the first, the first part of the, the face, edges that look like this are considered convex edges, and edges that look like this are concave edges. If you can envision like steps on a staircase, like the first edge that you come across is convex and then it goes to concave. And usually all the background edges or edges where you could see the first face but can't see the face behind it are all considered obscuring. And the problem right now is that you can't generate a data set by just looking at 2D images. You really need to start with a 3D model data set so that you can learn the different information to label the edges. And the data set I use to start is called the Thing I10K data set. And in that data set, there's 2,500 CAD models. And the main issue with these models is that they have these triangle definitions to them. So each face is defined by a triangle. And as you can see, each triangle has many different widths and many different lengths. So if I wanna just extract the edges starting in 3D, it's not exactly easy to tell. Like if I just find the intersection between adjacent triangles, that might give me a lot of extraneous segments. So the first step that I do is I analyze the surface normal differences between each triangle that are adjacent to each other. And if the, the difference is like a high amount, then I consider that an edge. And I've considered that threshold to be 0.2 radians. So it's a little hard to see, but on the right, you can see the extracted 3D edges. Uh, it might be a little hard to see, but it's pretty accurate based off of the scheme that I developed. And then the next step is to render these scenes into 2D and you could do that easily with like projective geometry and just doing simple projections. But the main thing I wanna come across is that I had to perform something called a ray cast. And in a ray cast, you send a ray from the camera to the 3D point. And as long as it's not obstructed by any other surface, then you can consider it as like a edge point. For example, if like a camera ray were to strike here, like this would naturally be a point because in 3D, if you were to just project it, this would be a point that would show but because of the ray cast, that point is no longer being shown. Now that we have our 2D scenes, it's important that we differentiate the different type of contours that we have. 
obscuring versus concave convex is the first easiest differentiation you can make. And as I mentioned before, obscuring kind of occurs on the background of our surfaces. And an easy way to tell is if you have a face and followed by a face that's hidden because of the camera vantage point, that is now an obscuring contour. And everything else where you can see both of the triangles or faces that intersect at a contour, that's a concave or convex one. And I sampled points. Basically, I found if the two triangles that intersect or faces that intersect are hidden or not using the Raycast method that I described before. And then to differentiate between concave and convex, you can basically use these alpha one and alpha two angles to entirely determine the convexity. And if alpha two is greater than alpha one, then it's a convex contour. But if alpha one is greater than alpha two, then it's a concave contour. And on the right, I've shown like a correctly labeled scene where you could see the yellow is the obscuring, uh, the green is convex and the blue is concave. Uh, there are a couple exceptions to this case. If you think about a 3D cylinder, the outer portion of the cylinder, when you find the difference in normals across of it, um, like that doesn't necessarily work because that's not actually edges in 3D. The only reason why a cylinder has edges when you project it into 2D is just because of the projection itself. So it's a very similar process to find those edges. Essentially, instead of using the normal threshold differences, you just take the adjacent triangles that didn't satisfy that, and then you plot them. And there's an example of the correctly labeled obscuring contours. And then there's occlusion. Occlusion is basically like if there's obstructions to the viewpoint. So if you look at the left, you can see there's extraneous segments being plotted where I show the arrows, as well as missing ones in the other one here, and then an extraneous one there. Basically, you can use the Raycast method again to sample points along the contour until you reach one where the occlusion first starts. And then when the occlusion first starts, you save that point and then you have your non-occluding contour. So the main problem so far with that approach is that when we have deal with curves, curves can be approximated with straight lines. So if you look at the top right, the curve on the upper part of the cylinder is very like segmented. It's not continuous at all. And the reason for that is because we've outputted all straight line segments that could approximate a curve like that. What we need to do is actually form a grouping algorithm to group those curves together. And we do this using a minimum spanning tree idea from computer science. And basically, each time you combine two contours, you keep track of the mean of them. And as you keep adding, you make sure that the means, uh, the, the difference in curvature isn't too high. And that's basically your cost function when you're adding two things in a minimum spanning tree. And combine if the threshold isn't too high and the categories have to be the same. Like you wouldn't want to com combine an obscuring and a convex contour. And if you look at the bottom here, you could see that the bottom portion of the cylinder isn't fully grouped yet. And that's because we use this mean idea. It's basically like a global grouping idea. But now we can go and look at the grouped versions that we have and do further grouping and do like a local grouping with smaller, um, the smaller contours. And basically we only group further if there's only one neighbor that combines at one end point, like you have two edges curving into each other. And as you can see on the right, this works really well. And we can see all of the contours correctly labeled and the curves correctly labeled as well. Uh, here are some of my results for this part. So I show on the left all the obscuring concave convex contours. And on the right, the unique colors show the different grouping patterns. And it's pretty accurate. And for the last part of my thesis, I did uh, segmentation using an architecture called SOLO. And SOLO, basically, the whole goal is to segment and give it a category and also give the mass prediction as well. And SOLO does something where it behaves with S by S grid cells and each grid cell is responsible for predicting a type of contour. And the difference with SOLO V2 is that it splits the mass generation step into two steps. So if you look at the mass branch on the bottom, that's stepped into a kernel and a feature branch.
the main adaptation I made to the architecture was to add in an endpoint regression step. And this was to help with further downstream tasks and maybe even help with the segmentation performance, because you can imagine that if you're trying to predict uh, the location of different contours and the junctions might be off. So this could definitely help in helping downstream tests. Here are some of my results with Solo. Uh, if you look, for example, here, these are all obscuring contours and it's all correctly labeled. And this is convex and this is correctly labeled as well. If you look from here across to here though, a lot of the convex edges are uh, detected with greater confidence. So this is 63 and that's 78. And this is without the endpoint regression. And this is with the endpoint regression. So in a lot of instances, the categories are predicted with much higher confidence. And also concave, since the concave contours are not very frequent in the data set, uh, the additional endpoint regression, if you look at the top right, predicts some of these concave contours. So it's a very promising direction to head towards. And here are some of the metrics just to show that our method with the endpoint regression does improve the average precision across all of the baseline metrics like uh, MAP, AP50, and then across each class as well, which is very promising. And some of the limitations were definitely in the initial definition of the STL meshes that I had. It especially affected in the grouping because some of the uh, contours were overlapping, which kind of screwed up the grouping algorithm a little bit. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, concave edges aren't very widespread in the data set. So different techniques will have to be used in the future to upsample those. And basically the main takeaway is that I was able to create this data set that would help in a variety of different applications in the future, like the robotic hand object interaction setting. And in the future, I'd probably try other settings as well, like in reinforcement learning or shape completion, where I would mask out different junctions and see if the algorithm could predict uh, the full shape. And uh, I want to thank my advisor, Professor Shi. He was really instrumental in this thesis, and it was great talking with him every week. And I want to thank a, a PhD student in this lab, Nehal. She was extremely helpful as well. And I would like to thank the robot department. And if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. So questions, and again, I'm going to remind you to repeat them. Uh, it's just through the, so if we show the, uh, the category branch automatically when you, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, he asked, how is the confidence uh, measured? How is the confidence measured in the outputs that I showed in the results? So how are these confidence uh, percentages done? Basically when in solo, when you output your predictions, there's, a, there's like a soft max basically. So it'll give you like 0.67 convex, 0.2 concave, et cetera. So I just plotted the most uh, frequent, like the highest percentage one here. Yeah. The question was, did I find a correlation between the, oops, sorry, the confidence level and accuracy? Between the confidence level and the accuracy of labeling? Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, is there any impact on um, low, like different illumination differences on the results that I got? Uh, I think the advantage of we using a data set like this was that I was able to set like a constant light source. So it wasn't really an issue of like shadows or different illumination differences that would probably play a part in more real world data sets, but this is very good for like research purposes. I have a question. Yeah. So you started out with these STL files, mm -hmm. which I would say the edges are actually quite clean. Mm -hmm. so what happens if you actually have like real data sets, for example, like 2D models without the edges, which mm -hmm. have noise? How do you think um, that could? The question was how, so this data is very clean, like the 3D mesh models that I used are very clean. And what would happen if I were to use a more real-world data set with noise? 
I think that I would probably have to perform some sort of denoising to start because the advantage of this data set obviously is that there's less noise, which is a huge benefit. Um, but yeah, a natural extension would definitely be to go to more abstract and um, harder to recognize objects and probably try to perform some denoising to begin with. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I'm gonna grab <laughs> the microphone from you. I want to thank all our presenters uh, for their awesome uh, thesis presentations. Thank the audience, both in person and online, for joining us.